Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Friends, welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. This is our ninth session on the Law of Contracts course which will be dealing with remedies for breach of contract. The topics which we will be covering under this session, the ninth session are as follows. You can see on your respective screens. Remedies for breach of contract that is herein we will discuss as to what are the various remedies under uh, various remedies available for breach of contract and mind you the remedies for breach of contract are not only restricted to the provisions under the Indian Contract Act. In fact, you will see that there are two other category of remedies. One is available under specific relief act and the third set of remedies common law remedy and uh, named as quantum merit that also we will be discussing in detail. The next is damages. So, basically damage is uh, one of the most uh, common remedy for breach of contract which is mentioned under or which is provided for under the Indian uh, Contract Act itself. So, in relation to damages we will be discussing the meaning of damages, types of damages. I will also be telling you that there is a difference between damage and damages, basis of assessment of damages, remoteness of damages. So, these are the various contours of this entire concept of damages and we, just, we won't be restricting ourselves to only understanding as to what are, what are damages and uh, the various types of damages. right? We will be getting into the details of what is remoteness of damages, what do we mean by uh, mitigation of damages as well. So, next measures of damages that is how you will be measuring the damages, mitigation of damages and penalty and liquidated damages also. So, our main focus would be on section 73 and 74 of the Indian Contract Act wherein you, you will be uh, seeing that uh, 73 mostly deals with the unliquidated type of damage, I mean it is dealing with unliquidated types of damages whereas 74 is focusing on the concept of penalty and liquidated damages. So, this would be the uh, main part of our entire discussion, but apart from this we would also be discussing about remedies under the specific relief act. specific relief act uh, which are twofold that is uh, injunction and specific performance and the last would be common law remedy which we would be discussing that is now I will just number it for you it will be making it easy for you to understand. So, the sixth or the last part of our uh, presentation of our session ninth session would be dealing with quantum merit. which is a common law remedy. Moment we say common law remedy, it means written law is not uh, declaring this remedy or is not providing for this remedy, but instead it is creation of the judiciary. It has come out from the judicial decisions. Remedies available for breach of contract. So, remedies also known as relief. Breach of contract we had just discussed in our uh, eighth session about discharge of contract. So, where therein we have discussed and already discussed in detail about breach of contract because I can just refresh your memories quickly because moment we say remedy is available for breach of contract we at least have to briefly understand first what do we mean by breach of contract. We know what remedy is, remedy means to grant relief, your legal right has been infringed, you are approaching the court, you approach the court, what for? because you want a remedy or a relief from the court because your rights have been affected, they have been injured, they have been infringed, right. 
Now, a uh, breach of contract basically means non-fulfillment of obligation under contract. What do we mean by obligation? So, there are duties, the parties fix duties for each other or responsibilities for each other under the contract. Breach means that one of the parties falters in fulfillment of such an obligation or you can say uh, falters in uh, uh, completing the promise which has been made under the contract. So, we had also discussed about uh, the two types of breaches, breach of contract that is an actual breach and anticipatory breach. Uh, before we move on uh, with our session, I will just quickly give a recap of it. Actual breach of contract means when on the due date of the performance of the contract, the party who was to perform the obligation decides not to fulfill the obligation and informs the other party about it then in that case it is known as actual breach of contract that means on the due date you decide not to fulfill your obligation under the contract. So, now what do we mean by anticipatory breach of contract? From anticipatory breach of contract we understand that uh, if say for example we enter into a contract today right and we have decided that under this contract I would be fulfilling my obligation I, in the order of performance uh, of the uh, obligations under the contract I have to perform my obligation first and thereafter you will be in a position to perform your obligation because that is what the requirement of the Indian contract act is order of performance has to be maintained right. So, uh, say we decided under the contract that from uh, one say one month from today we would be performing the obligation under the I, I would be performing the obligation under the contract but say uh, 10 days from today I inform you that see although under the contract we had decided that I have to fulfill my obligation on such a such uh, such and such date but today itself I am in informing you that I would not be in a position to perform the obligation right. So, communication is important and the other party now the ball is in the court of the other party that is the other party may choose to either wait till the designated date till the due date or the party may uh, choose to terminate the contract there and then. But whatever this affected party decides he or she will, ha will have to inform it to the other party. So, this is what anticipatory breach of contract is which has been incorporated under section 39 of the Indian contract act. Now, let us move back to our uh, session here. Remedy is available for breach of contract under the Indian contract act, the specific relief act and common law remedy which I just informed you here quantum merit. Various remedies namely here in this point we are only touching upon the laws which have provided us with these remedies. Now, what are those remedies namely has been discussed here. So, you can see damages, damages is a remedy provided under the Indian contract act 1872, specific performance and injunction remedy which are provided under specific relief act. Now, see uh, this term ICA stands for Indian Contract Act and SRA is the short form for Specific Relief Act. Please be careful. And the third set of remedy which I have been repeating again and again since uh, the start of this session is Quantum Meruit, Common Law Remedy. So, we will be discussing all these remedies and uh, let us see what they are all dealing with. We will start with discussion on damages because that is the most common and most prominent remedy for breach of contract. Now, in the beginning itself uh, when I was introducing this uh, today's session to you, I had informed you that you have to be very clear uh, while distinguishing between damage and damages. Damage is different, damages is different. You have to be careful, you cannot use these terms uh, loosely interchangeably. So, the term damage is different from the term damages. What we are concerned with for this uh, particular session or for remedy uh, or under remedy for breach of contract is damages. Damage means injury 
and damages means monetary compensation for the loss suffered by the aggrieved party in a breach of contract. So, understand that you have to be careful. It is damages which we are referring to and not damage or the loss which has been caused. Right? In fact, we are uh, dealing with remedy and remedy is uh, damages. The object of awarding damages for breach of a contract is to put the injured party in the same financial position as if the contract had been performed. Now, see uh, it is always said that the difference between uh, there is whenever we try to distinguish between civil law, criminal law, the first and the foremost point on which we try to differentiate between the two things is in relation to the uh, punishment, the remedy. So, what is basically the object of uh, criminal law? The object of criminal law is to punish the wrongdoer so that it acts as a deterrent for the entire society that you have to uh, behave yourself and you cannot act in a particular manner because this will be the consequence of your action. Right. Then, uh, if we, uh, then if we say the objective of civil law, it is right there as mentioned on your screen here in this point. So, when we say the object of awarding damages for breach of contract is to put the injured party in the same financial position as if the contract had been performed. So, basically it is to provide uh, uh, one can say compensation to the party which has been wronged or put that party who has been wronged or wrong has been committed against that party to its original position. right? So, this is a point of difference just to add to your knowledge. Now, coming to various types of damages, first set I have written is ordinary or general and special damages, this is the first classification which one can make. Then I have mentioned here nominal and exemplary damages which is a concept which you would have uh, uh, seen under torts also, the law of torts also, because therein under types of damages too much emphasis is made on nominal damages, exemplary damages, right. Liquidated and unliquidated damages is a third set of classification which I have provided here, you can see on your screens. Let us just very quickly before we move further in, into our session, let us just first very quickly distinguish between all three, these three sets of uh, types of damages. Now, to start with ordinary or general and special damages, right. So, general and special damages, uh, these set of damages have been incorporated under, if I may tell you, section 73 of the Indian Contract Act, section 73 of the Indian Contract Act because later in this session we will be discussing about a judgment known as very famous English landmark judgment uh, related to damages which is known as Hadley versus Baxendale. We will be discussing that because Hadley versus Baxendale is an English decision which had distinguished between uh, general damages and special damages. right? In what circumstances general damage court can ask up, uh, the wrongdoer to pay general damages to the other person, in what situation one can ask that person to pay special damages, right. So, general damages basically are those which take place uh, in normal course of business, right. So, if this act will happen definitely the consequence of that act will be this, right. So, it is like that, it is going to occur in normal course of business if a person uh, uh, does not fulfill his or her obligation. Special damages because the name special itself means that in order to claim such kind of damages in case dispute arises in future, you need to bring it to the knowledge of the party, other party while entering into the contract itself. That see, we will have to be careful because if you would not, if you will commit uh, default in fulfilling your obligation under the contract. I may suffer this kind of consequence also, right. So, if it is some special kind of uh, circumstance which will result as a consequence of the breach, you, you beforehand or if I may say at the time of entering into the contract itself, 
you have to inform about the special circumstance to the other party then only at a later stage you will be in a position to claim such kind of damages now the second set of classification of the types of damages nominal and exemplary now nominal simply means so if i may just give you a reference of law of torts here because i was telling you that nominal damages exemplary damages are uh, many a times discussed under torts right because see you will say then why torts we are discussing it under contracts because i just mentioned it a uh, few minutes ago to you that section 73 of the indian contract act 1872 is dealing with unliquidated damages that is the damages which have not been pre estimated by the parties and have not been incorporated in the contract itself right so unliquidated damages now when we say nominal damages it means your legal right has been infringed even if to even if uh, you have not suffered any kind of damage or any major loss uh, no damage has been caused or no major loss has accrued then in that case but your legal right has been infringed the court may grant nominal or reasonable damages to you as a result of the infringement of your right legal right and moment we say exemplary exemplary as the name itself suggests it is a huge amount of money which is granted as uh, granted in the form of damages because uh, the act which you have committed it has it may have caused a very a uh, huge loss to the other party right now the third set of classification which uh, is there on your screen is liquidated and unliquidated damages now liquidated damages is a concept which you will see under section 74 under section 74 of the indian contract act we will be coming to it in detail later and unliquidated i have again and again i have been telling to you is covered under section 73 of the indian contract act so what do we mean by liquidated unliquidated unliquidated as informed earlier is something which has not been pre estimated so the uh, the damage which will be caused and uh, the type of damages which should be given if the damage is caused basically it's like pre estimation of damages right pre estimation of damages and that is what we call as liquidated it's a pre estimation so parties have themselves calculated this thing that if this this uh, uh, promises or obligation is not fulfilled what can be the repercussion how much loss can be caused and uh, what one party will be giving to the other party right so it's a pre estimation which they have already made unliquidated is left at the discretion of the court the court taking in consideration various factors like remoteness of damages and also looking into the mitigating factors if any highlighted by the other party so on and so forth and calculate uh, what should be the reasonable amount of damage which can be granted in a particular situation now let's move on to the relevant provisions under the indian contract act which i have been stating again and again which are section 73 and 74 section 73 compensation for loss or damage caused by breach of contract when a contract has been broken moment we say contract has been broken we are referring to breach contract has been broken means breach has been committed now because see this provision is dealing with remedy remedy for breach of contract so now we are saying if breach has occurred what what will happen now so the party who suffers by such breach is entitled to receive from the party who has broken the contract compensation for any loss or damage caused to him thereby that means the court will helping court will help you out in getting compensation from the other party that is the party who is the wrong doer the party who has committed a wrong against you or who has committed breach of contract will be made to pay compensation to you for any loss or damage which has been caused to you by the action of 
uh, other party which naturally arose in the usual course of things so the compensation which can which will be granted to you will be keeping in mind natural uh, naturally uh, arising act naturally arising consequences or naturally arising uh, damage in the usual course of things so here we had referred to uh, general damages remember in the previous slide we had spoken about general damages so it says uh, general damages will be granted of which the parties knew when they made the contract to be likely to result from the breach of it now here we are talking about special damages to be granted right general damages for the damage which has been which has occurred in natural course of business and special damages for the damage which the parties knew when they had made the contract that it may likely result may be the likely result if breach is committed right that is why new that means knowledge is very important and the, mind you please keep this thing uh, in your mind this knowledge which we are referring to is imputed to the parties at the time of entering into the contract itself not that the contract has been made and later on one of the parties is informing the other party that see if you will uh, not fulfill your obligation timely this will be the consequence so by doing that the party cannot uh, claim that i had already informed this thing to the other because what is the requirement of section 73 is that if you wish to claim special damages it is all the more important that you bring it to the knowledge of the other party that the the wrong act or the breach committed if committed by the uh, by the other party will have a likely result will will lead to such a result and may cause more even more damages uh, more damage to you apart from those uh, such damage which which will result in natural course of the business right such compensation which has been referred to here such compensation is not to be given for any remote and indirect loss or damage sustained by reason of the breach we are dealing with remoteness of damages here remoteness of damages there is a concept or there is a saying in law that a person cannot be made to cannot be held liable till infinity for the act of or for the consequences of his act right you cannot make that person held uh, 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 liable for each and every result of his action right that is what that person cannot be held liable for a very remote possibility or a remote result which has taken place so it says compensation is not to be given for any remote and indirect loss person can only be made to pay for such damage or such loss which was reasonably foreseeable it could be reasonably foreseeable that if such act will take place the consequence of it is this right uh, it should be of such a nature not that for every each and every result which occurs of the breach of the contract the person who has committed the breach will be held liable for no it is not the result no no it is not like that so remoteness of damages is one of the factors which is taken into consideration by the court while deciding upon or while measuring assessing the uh, quantum of damages which has to be given to the to the party whose rights have been infringed or against whom breach has been committed it provides for compensation in terms of damages arising due to breach of contract we are referring to section 73 here that is it provides for compensation in terms of damages arising due to breach of contract according to this section compensation would be awarded only for the loss in regular course of business or such a loss which the parties knew would likely occur because of such breach so this is what i have already told you regular course of business general damages or ordinary damages will be granted 
or which or such a loss which parties knew would likely occur because of such breach reference is being made to special damages here challenge lies in now this is an important point this is an important point challenge lies in proving actual loss or damage suffered as only such loss can be recovered and remote or indirect loss or damages are specifically excluded from the purview of this section so if you are claiming relief from the court you will have to prove in the court that the uh, you had entered into contract the person the other party committed a breach of the contract and as a result of that breach what were the consequences which uh, because of which you suffered section 70 i was just mentioning to you that uh, section 73 incorporates this uh, the two types of damages two sets of damages which are general damages and special damages and this this uh, classification uh, between the two set of damages between these two set of damages comes from the judgment of hadley versus bagsendale i'll very very briefly tell you what this judgment was all about and then thereafter we can read this observation which was made in the judgment of hadley versus bagsendale courtesy which the classification of general damages and special damages came to be incorporated under section 73 of the indian contract act now hadley versus bagsendale in this case what happened now there there is this person who was a mill owner and uh, and there was a very important the, uh, he was a mill owner so obviously there was a machine uh, in his uh, factory and a particular part a particular uh, part if i may say of that machine which was a crankshaft it broke right and because of that breaking of the crankshaft the machine stopped working right and that was the only crankshaft which the mill owner was having and because of breaking of that crankshaft the work stopped in his mill right so he had to get a new crankshaft uh, made and he got in touch with a company with the, with the with the manufacturer with the makers of the crankshaft and uh, who had asked him who had asked the mill owner to send the old crankshaft to them so that the size can be measured and accordingly a similar crankshaft can be made which will be sent to the mill owner so for that purpose the mill owner entered into a contract with a carriage company who were to carry this crankshaft and deliver it to the uh, manufacturer to the person who was to make the crankshaft new crankshaft for the mill owner and the mill owner had informed the uh, this carriage company that no delay should occur basically just told them that no delay should occur otherwise work will suffer right just this much but still due to certain reasons delay in delivering that old crankshaft and uh, getting the new crankshaft the entire process to carriage way the carriage company not carriage way corrected i stand corrected the carriage company they uh, committed a delay in the delivery and because of which this mill owner suffered huge losses because till the period the uh, crankshaft was away or the new crankshaft could not come the mill had stopped working because the machine was not functional due to the uh, absence of crankshaft and also the fact that one prominent contract which the mill owner was to get that also went from his hands because his uh, mill was not functional right now when this delay occurred the mill owner sued the carriage company on this ground that as a result of their action or as a result of their breach or uh, non fulfillment of the oblig obligations as required under the contract right led to the loss in profit led to the losing of the government contract which they were to get and obviously the day to day uh, the the day to day work which the mill was generally doing the day to day uh, money which they were making so all these things all these categories of uh, damages they were claimed from the carriage company now the court asked one thing that uh, 
did you inform the carriage company about the fact that if the crankshaft will be delayed the company the factory is not working the mill has stopped working and the mill was just shut down and was of uh, was non functional did you inform that significant point that important point to the carriage company while entering into this contract the answer was no because they the mill owner was also trying to claim the loss which accrued because of uh, not getting the government contract the court held that see one has to draw a line somewhere one can not the person who has committed the wrong cannot be held liable ad infinitum ad infinitum means still infinity that means for each and every result of your action you cannot be held liable so that is why in hadley versus bagsendale the court classified the court considered uh, the, the court made a, a distinction between the two sets of damages which is general damages and special damages now keeping this thing in mind let's read this observation from hadley versus bagsendale where two parties have made a contract which one of them has broken the damages which the other party ought to receive that is should receive in respect of such breach of contract should be either such as may reasonably and fairly be considered as arising naturally we are talking about general damages here as may reasonably and fairly be considered as arising naturally that is according to usual course of things from such breach of contract itself or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties that means in knowledge of both parties at the time they made the contract as the probable result of the breach of it herein we are talking about special damages now compensation not to be given for any remote and indirect loss or damage sustained by reason of breach we had earlier also mentioned it i am again highlighting it here we are talking about remoteness of damages here so not to be given compensation is not to be given for remote loss or for indirect loss of your action damages are measured by the loss actually suffered by the party not the uh side losses or indirect losses the loss which is actually suffered so you need to distinguish between loss actually suffered and the indirect loss or the remote loss one judgment i have highlighted here uh which is a very extremely old judgment of 1898 of madras high court if you could just uh, see on your screens it will make your concept clear when we are talking what do we mean by remoteness of damage this judgment of madras railway company versus govinda is dealing with the concept of remoteness of damages plaintiff who was a tailor delivered a sewing machine and some clothes to defendant railway company to be sent to a place where he expected to carry on his business in an upcoming festival due to mistakes made by company's employees goods were delayed and were not delivered until any notice to the railway company that goods were required to be delivered within fixed time for any special purpose that means the tailor had not informed the railway company about the fact that uh, the goods were required to be delivered within fixed period of time for a special purpose right because there was an upcoming festival in that area and he wanted to do business and gain profits so when he had delivered that uh, the machine of his and the clothes to the railway company he failed to inform them that failed to uh, bring it to their notice that the goods were required to be delivered within fixed time for a specific purpose now when the delay occurred and the delivery was made after the festival had uh, ended so the plaintiff the tailor decided to sue the company for the delay and for the loss of profits which uh, he could have made the court held that damages which the tailor was claiming were too remote that is the profits which he could have earned 
uh, if he would have been a part of that festival, if he would have been able to work during the period of the festival there. B but because this is something which could not be reasonably foreseen unless and until you inform the company. So, in this case the court said at max general damages can be given but it is too remote a damage or it is a special situation which is being referred here which was not informed to the railway company. Now, next aspect of section 73 in estimating the loss or damage arising from a breach of contract, the means which existed of remedying the inconvenience caused by the non-performance of the contract must be taken into account. It is an interesting aspect, it is an interesting concept incorporated under section 73 which is mitigation of damages. Now, what do we mean by mitigation? Mitigation basically means dilution, dilution of uh, damages, right? reducing damages. So, when we talk about criminal law and after trial has been held and uh, the accused has been pronounced guilty or guilt has been proven, the second stage which comes is to pronounce the sentence right? as to how much punishment is to be given to, to the accused right? or to the person who has committed the offence. Now, for that purpose, the court takes into consideration from the side of both the parties that is prosecution as well as defence, uh, the fact, the mitigating factors as well as the aggravating factors. Aggravating factors means the factors which will, which will lead the court to enhance the punishment to be given to the wrongdoer. Whereas, when we talk about mitigating factors, they, they'll, they are those factors which will help the court in reduction of or in dilution of the uh, sentence or the punishment which must be given to the wrongdoer, right. So, this is something which has to be taken into consideration. Mitigating factors are those which dilute the, uh, which, which, which basically dilute the damages and uh, the aggravating are which will increase. So, here we are talking about mitigation of damages, right. So, let us see what it means. Which existed of remedying the court basically here is trying to tell you that see, consider a situation wherein say if I am, uh, if I have committed a uh, breach of contract against the other party, right, fine. I have committed breach, but if there is some kind of contributory role also played by the other party, which means I committed breach, but if the other person had acted cautiously, he could have reduced the quantum of damages which has accrued to him. If he could have been, if, if it was possible, there was a possibility of him having reduced the damages or have, uh, he could have made efforts and reduced the damages or the losses. Where, uh, damage or losses which accrued to him, but he did not, he acted in a casual manner and did not take any action. In that situation, it will amount to mitigation of damages. Then I cannot sit back and claim that see, he has uh, uh, caused me this much quantum of damages, this much amount of uh, damage. So, I should be getting this, these uh, damages, right, this amount of damages, right, or compensation. Mitigation of damages means the court will take into consideration the role of the other party also. The other party should not have acted in a negligent manner, right. If I could have controlled the damage, but I failed to do it deliberately or due to my negligence, the court will take this point into consideration and it is a mitigating factor and it will uh, reduce or dilute the damage caused. Now, I would just want to highlight one aspect here that see if you have seen your uh, Bayer Acts of Indian Contract Act 1872, you will see that too many illustrations have been appended to section 73. It is my humble request to you all to please go through all those provisions because it is impossible in uh, this session to take up all those illustrations, but here I am trying to clear your concepts. So, when you read those illustrations, you are able to relate this concept there and you are able to better understand this thing. 
when no loss arises from the breach of contract only damage nominal damages are awarded again in your torts you must have studied about injuria sign dam no damnum sign injuria that is what matters is that the the other person the other party committed a wrong or what we say injured or infringed your legal right that is enough the person will be asked to pay damages to you right now the quantum of damages will depend upon the loss which has accrued to you so exactly is the situation here when we say nominal damages we are trying to say that see you committed breach my legal right has been infringed maybe no losses have accrued to me because i could take care and i have uh, taken care of it that no loss accrued so in that kind of situation nominal damages will still be awarded to me reason being that my right has been infringed and ubi just be remedium where there is a legal right there is a legal remedy damages are given by way of restitution that is restoration and compensation only so restoration and compensation and not by way of punishment we have to understand very carefully that the damages which we are referring to as a remedy for breach of contract those damages are compensatory in nature those damages are not punitive in nature not penal in nature you are not trying to punish the other person punishment is the role played in uh, criminal law herein you are trying to compensate the person against whom wrong has been committed right so that's why keeping that objective in mind one has to understand that damages are compensatory in nature and they are not penal or punitive in nature the aggrieved party can therefore recover the actual loss caused to him as compensation moving on to section 74 it provides for as i had told you earlier also it provides for liquidated damages where the contract specifically states the sum to be paid in case of a breach contract specifically states i have already told you what do we mean by liquidated damages it is a pre estimation right pre estimation of damages not damage damages specifically states the sum to be paid in case of a breach or this is first which is dealing with liquidated damages or provides for a stipulation by the way of penalty right so this is second so first remedy which is uh, incorporated under section 74 is of liquidated damages that is when the contract is specifically stating the sum which is to be paid in case of a breach or secondly uh, the contract provides for a stipulation stipulation means a condition by the way of penalty then the aggrieved party because see be it liquidated damages be it penalty this is something which the parties have mutually agreed to and have incorporated it under their under that contract now then the aggrieved party is entitled to reasonable compensation not exceeding this is very important not exceeding the amount or the penalty stipulated for in the contract now what do we mean by this we are mean we mean that fine the parties have done a good job that they have incorporated the relevant term they have incorporated they have done a pre estimation because they are the best judges they are the best judges of that thing of that commercial transaction which they have entered into that if one party fails to fulfill the obligation how much loss can uh, the uh, how much loss can it lead to and how much uh sufferance will the other party have to go through so they have already done a pre estimation of it right so they are the best judges of it but the result may be that yes breach has occurred but not too much loss has been caused so what happens what is this provision trying to tell you that the amount which has been mentioned in the contract or the penalty which has been stipulated in the contract they are the maximum which the court can give the court can give a lesser amount as compensate as uh, damages or the court can put levy a relevantly uh, a relevantly if i may say uh, comparatively lesser penalty that can happen 
but more than the amount which has been pre estimated or more than the penalty which has been uh, highlighted in the contract that is not possible that is what section 74 is telling you further then it says further proof of actual loss or damage is not a condition precedent for awarding such compensation but this is very important aspect for section 73 this which we are saying for the proof of actual loss or damage is not a condition precedent for awarding such compensation we are trying to say that when in section 73 it was mentioned that see if the party is able to prove the actual losses which has which the party has accrued then in that case it will help the court in deciding how much compensation is to be given but if no loss uh, has occurred at all the nominal damages will be given so in in uh, according to section 73 it is important to give proof of actual loss or damage but for section 74 it says uh, further proof of actual loss or damage is not a condition for condition precedent for awarding such a compensation in the cases where the damage fixed damages are fixed beforehand are genuine and pre estimate of the damages then these are called what we have already discussed liquidated damages while when the damages are fixed in order to prevent the breach of contract then damages are called a penalty so this is the difference between or you can say definition of liquidated damages and penalty that is liquidated damages are those damages which are fixed beforehand by the parties and are genuine reasonable and they are pre estimate of the damages that can actually uh, accrue to the party who has uh, suffered while when the damages are fixed in order to prevent the breach of contract then damages are called a penalty because penalty is in uh, is of that nature only that you are trying to find punish the person right There are three illustrations which you can see on your screens. So, in order to better understand the uh, relevance of liquidated damages penalty, let us see these three illustrations which have been taken from section 74 of the Indian Contract Act. So, to start with A, A contracts with B to pay B rupees 1000 if he fails to pay B rupees 500 on a given day right so a has promised to pay uh, b rupees 1000 on a particular day and in the contract it has been decided that if he fails to give rupees 500 to b on that specific day then in that case he will have to pay him 1000 rupees now a fails to pay b rupees uh, 500 on that designated day now b is entitled to recover from a such compensation not exceeding rupees 1000 so you can say this is the maximum limit so even if parties have done a genuine and pre estimate uh, correct pre estimation of uh, the damages still the court will have to take it into consideration if uh, they are not uh, inflated uh, estimation or i mean if it, it should not be inflated estimation it should not be uh, extremely high and extremely uh, punitive kind of uh, penalty right or liquidated damages so court has to consider court cannot blindly go by what has been incorporated in the terms of the contract so the court may uh, keep this as the maximum and looking into the other factors reach to a conclusion about the quantum of uh, damages now a who owes money to be a money lender b is a money lender here so a undertakes to repay b by delivering to him 10 mounds of grain on a certain date so he has uh, taken money from the money lender and in return he has undertaken or he has promised to repay the money lender by delivering to him on a certain later date 10 mounds of grain and stipulates that in the undertaking or in that particular contract it has been stipulated or a condition has been uh, mentioned that in event of his not delivering stipulated amount that is 10 mounds of grain by the date which has been decided he shall be liable to deliver 20 mounds you had borrowed money from me now 
instead of uh, money in return for the money which I gave to you, it has been decided or you have undertaken that you would be uh, in return you will be giving me this a particular quantity of certain grains, right? And it has been decided between the two of us. In fact, you have undertaken that uh, in case you fail to deliver that much quantity of grain to me on that decided date, then the consequence of it will be you will have to give me the double the quantity of uh, the grain which you had promised, which here is 20 mounds. This is a stipulation by way of penalty. We had just seen in the previous slide here, you can see that uh, when the damages are fixed in order to prevent the breach of contract, then the damages are called a penalty. Now here, it will, the fact that in case he falters to deliver 10 mounds of grain on the specified date, the repercussion or the consequence of it will be that he will have to deliver double the quantity of grain, uh, 20 mounds of grain uh, in return or in lieu of it. In such a situation, it is said that it does, it does amount to penalty because purpose of the penalty is to stop the other person from committing the breach, not to punish, right? It is not to punish. Yes, it is in penalty is in nature of a punishment only. But its purpose is not to actually punish the other person. It is in fact incorporated so that it acts as a deterrent for the other person and the other person uh, stops himself from committing any kind of breach. Third illustration states that A undertakes to repay B a loan of rupees 1000 by 5 equal monthly installments that is 200 rupees each. Right, 200 rupees each. So, rupees 1000 by 5 equal monthly installments, 200 into 5 is 1000, right. So, with a stipulation that is a condition that in default of payment of any particular installment of 200 rupees, whole of the remaining amount shall become due. So, for example, first 200 was paid, second 200 was uh, also paid, but when third 200 uh, came into picture, that was defaulted. So, moment the third default uh, comes into picture, now the person has to pay 600, right? Because the remaining amount also becomes due. This stipulation is not by way of penalty because you are not asking something for something extra. In case of illustration B, in case of illustration B, we saw that you are saying, I have to give you 10 mounds of grain. But if I commit a default and I am not able to deliver it timely to you, then I undertake that in, uh, in lieu of that uh, default which I will do, I will instead deliver to you double the quantity, right, 20 mounds. So, that is more than what I am entitled, more than what you are entitled to, I am promising to give to you if I commit breach. But here in illustration, uh, if, uh, sorry, if we talk about illustration C, we, uh, are we are saying this thing that I am, we, we are not asking for anything extra. We are just saying that you have not fulfilled a particular uh, condition or obligation under the contract as it was decided. Now, as a repercussion, the entire amount which you had to give to me has become due in one go, right? So, nothing extra is being asked for. So, one cannot say that it is in uh, terms of penalty. The next set of remedy which is provided uh, is relevant, pro is given under specific relief act which I already told you in the beginning is injunction and specific performance. Let us see what the specific relief act 1963 or what is popularly known as SRA has to say. Section 36 of the specific relief act deals with an injunction or provides for an injunction, provides for an injunction which is a preventive remedy which may either be temporary in nature or perpetual, right? Injunction basically refers to restraint from breaching the contract by the other party. It is a restraint. Section 10 is important here for the perp from the point of view of specific performance of a contract. What do we mean by specific performance of the contract? 
specific performance means that say for example uh, you had to deliver certain goods to me and in return of it i had to give you the money you committed a uh, default you committed a breach and did not deliver the goods to me timely i went to the court and i claimed specific performance as the remedy one till now we just studied about damages damages means the loss Uh, or damage which has accrued to you keeping that into consideration the damages are the compensation which the court grants right then here we are saying the party may even go to the court and say that see i don't need compensation i don't need damages instead ask the other person to perform his or her obligation as had been decided under the contract right so that is what specific performance is Section ten of the Specific Relief Act mentions the cases wherein specific performance of a contract may be allowed by the court. First is when there is no standard for ascertaining actual damage. That is, it is very difficult for the court also to assess the the quantum of actual damages. Then, in that case, uh, specific performance can also be ordered, or the person. who may have who may have suffered breach of contract also is not in a position to actually assess the quantum of damages and claim the amount instead he or she thinks it better to claim uh, as remedy specific performance of the contract itself next is when monetary compensation would not afford adequate relief so for that i have mentioned this example here that usually courts are entitled to presume in case of breach of contract that in transfer of immovable property mere compensation is not an adequate relief this example is uh, elaborating the second point which had been uh, highlighted here right this was the first point the second point here so usually courts are entitled to presume in case of breach of contract that in transfer of immovable property mere compensation is not an adequate relief and specific performance is an adequate relief right so specific performance is an adequate relief whereas in case of movable property compensation is ordinary relief and specific performance is exceptionally given so if i may just put it in simpler words generally general presumption is that if the transaction is related to immovable property then in that case the compensation is not adequate relief specific performances whereas it is the other way round in case of movable property the last part is dealing with the definition of quantum merit which is the common law remedy it means as much as is deserved and often can be seen as the legal form of equitable compensation or restitution it is a le- when a legal action is brought in the court to recover compensation for work done and labor performed where no price has been agreed this is a situation what we call as quantum merit quantum means proportion merit means the merit the work which you have done there are two essentials of uh, quantum merit first is one of the parties makes a breach of contract or prevents the performance of it by the other side second is the party injured by the breach of the contract who has already performed a part of it elects to be discharged from further performance of the contract and brings an action to compensate for the value of the work he has already done so it's a common law remedy the third set of remedy which we had to discuss in this session with this i would wind up the session for today thank you